quote, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. That means twisted. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Do you affirm that, sir? Do you defend what Ellen White said there in Great Controversy, that the devil was able to twist the mind of God on the cross, causing him to doubt his resurrection and if his sacrifice would be accepted? Furthermore, the reason I was asking about this one specifically, seven pages later, after the resurrection, Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. He ascended to the heavenly courts and from God himself heard the assurance that his atonement for the sins of men had been ample, that through his blood all might gain eternal life. The Father ratified the covenant made with Christ, that he would receive repentant and obedient men and would love them even as he loves his son. Christ was to complete his work and fulfill his pledge to make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir, Isaiah 13, 12. All power in heaven and on earth was given to the Prince of Life, and he returned to his followers in a world of sin that he might impart to them of his power and glory. He had to go to heaven to figure out if his sacrifice was indeed accepted, and then he returned for 40 days to then ascend again. So show us that from the Bible, please, sir. Did Satan twist Jesus Christ's mind for him to doubt his own resurrection? So today we're going to do something a little bit different. This was brought to my attention and I wanted to speak out on this. We're doing something called Answering Adventist Skeptics. We're going to take a look at one of Mrs. White's problem texts and we're going to try to answer it. Here we have ellenwhite.org. We're going to take a look at one of her problem texts. We're going to search it out. That problem text would be Satan wrung the heart of Christ. So let's take a look at this. We'll tell you what the skeptics are saying about this. So the Desire of Ages, page 753, Satan with his fierce temptations. Is that unbiblical so far? No, right? Satan tempted Jesus Christ. Did he not? And then it says, wrung the heart of Jesus. So Satan wrung the heart of Jesus. Now, there are some people out there that say this is unbiblical. Well, first of all, what does the word wrong mean? Let's go to Google real quick. Wrong is the past tense of ring, to squeeze and twist something to force liquid from it. She wrung the cloth out of the sink. So does this mean that Satan twisted the heart of Jesus in a way that caused him to doubt his own resurrection? Is that what this is saying? Or, I mean, this could mean so many things. It could even indicate pain and suffering that Satan twisted the heart of Jesus, causing his heart to break in, a, in, in an emotional sense. It doesn't necessarily mean that Satan twisted his mind. Okay, and so that's what I was getting from some of the skeptics out there. And then it says, the Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth the gr from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. Because remember, biblically, when the Jews were offering up their sacrifices, God has to first accept. When Cain and Abel offered their sacrifices, whose was accepted and whose was not? Abel's sacrifice was accepted, Cain's sacrifice was not. Luke 24, starting from verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, which is the tomb of Christ, bringing the spices which uh, they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were uh, much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Those are angels. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he, Jesus Christ, spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. So Jesus Christ was confident that he would rise again. He was confident that he would, he would rise again. 
And the, this was actually the words of Jesus. This was the words of Jesus, him being quoted by the angels. He, Jesus said that he would be crucified and in the third day would rise again. Let's take a look at Matthew 20, starting from verse 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge, and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise Again, so these, this is Jesus' own words. He knew that he was going to rise again. So then how come Mrs. White says that he doubted in his mind of his own resurrection? Did that happen in, 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 in Scripture? Did he doubt? Let's, go, let's take a look at the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26. I guess we could start from verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Why was he sorrowful? Why was he very heavy? Why was he sorrowful? For what? If he knew that he was going to, this is just a sacrifice, you're going to die, you're going to raise again. Why was he sorrowful? Watch. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Hold on. Jesus Christ could have... Remember what Jesus Christ said? When, 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 um, he, was, when he was getting arrested, he told Peter, Hey, don't you know that I, I could call him my dad? And he will bring legions of angels to come and rescue me? So he could, just by an instance, call on his dad. He could be rescued right there. But here he's very sorrowful. It says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Why? Why? Was he, was he as, as confident here as he was when he was explaining these things to the disciples? You know, the, the day before? It says, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it is if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me if it's possible. Sorrowful even unto death. Why is he pleading that God would let this cup pass from him? In Isaiah 53, it explains that. I mean, it, it, it was God who had to punish him. It says, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye, uh, what, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Whose flesh is he talking about? Peter doesn't know what's about to happen. Even though, uh, you know, Jesus Christ told him so many times, Peter doesn't know what's about to happen. He didn't know. You can even you can even go into the future. Peter denied Christ because he was not ready that Christ was about to get crucified. He wasn't ready for that crisis. He wasn't ready. So what flesh is he is he talking about? What flesh is Jesus Christ talking about here? Yeah, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. What flesh? Peter's flesh, James and John's flesh, Christ's flesh. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Let's keep going. Look what it says. And again, you can, you can hear the agony in his voice. You can hear that he's going through something. Why was he, why was he so afraid? Did he doubt in his mind? Did he doubt that he can actually do this? And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them um, and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. 
Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep now, sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Let's go to Luke 22. Luke 22 is the same, the same thing. He was again at the Garden, garden of Gethsemane, um, and he was withdrawn with them from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Why did he need strength from an angel? He didn't want to go through it, did he? Why did he, why did not, he not want to go through it? Did he doubt in his mind that this was actually going to happen, that, that, that he was actually going to resurrect, even though he was confident before? He was confident. He was saying, he was saying hey, look, I'm going to, I'm, hey guys, I'm going to die, but I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to die, but I'm going to resurrect. But at this, at this hour, at this hour, did he have doubts in his mind? Why would he go through this if he did not have the temptation of doubt in his mind? I'm not saying that he doubted. But he was being tempted to doubt. It says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So his sweat was even like blood falling down to the ground. Why? Why is he in so much pain and agony that he had to, he sweated blood? I'm not saying that he's lost faith. I'm not saying that he doubted. I'm saying he is being tempted to doubt, so much so that sweat of blood was dropping down into the ground from him. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to, the, to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye rise? Pray, lest ye enter into temptation. So obviously... Jesus Christ was in great pain and agony, so much so that he was sweating drops of blood. What did he say on the cross? Let's see what he says, said on the cross. Matthew 27, starting from verse 45. Now the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land unto the ninth hour. So darkness, if you guys know, the light is a symbol, symbol for God's glory. It says here that there was darkness on the land. So the light did not even, the, the light was not even there. No light. The light being the symbol for God's glory wasn't even there. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So he felt forsaken on the cross. Let me ask, what does it mean to be forsaken? If you go to Deuteronomy, I believe it's in Deuteronomy 31. In Deuteronomy 31, starting from verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. So, then it says, Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, says, I will forsake them, and look what it says, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us, because God, because our God is not amongst, among us? And I surely will hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought in that day they are turned unto other gods. So, remember, Jesus Christ was made sin for us so that God would punish Him instead of us. On the cross, Jesus Christ was punished, forsaken by God. Was this a true, for, or was, was this a true forsakening, or is this an act? Is this fake? It's just, he's just acting. Being forsaken means God will hide your, His face from you. If God is the light, if God is light, if God's glory is light, even the clouds hid the glory of, of God's face from Jesus Christ. It says on the, on the sixth hour that it was darkness upon all the land. 
even the, the light did not shine on Jesus Christ on the cross. God's glory was hid from him. In Isaiah 53, let's go to Isaiah 53 real, real, just real quick, and then we'll get back to Mrs. White's writings. Starting from verse 4, you guys know this text already. You guys know this passage. I, I'm, I'm sure you guys know this passage. If not, then you guys got to read it. Actually, we can go from verse 1. Who hath believed our reports? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Out of, yeah, out of a dry, dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So Jesus Christ did not really, was not really an attractive man. It was his character that was attractive. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So who's, who's, who smote him? God did. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Imagine your own father punishing you for a different group of people, even though you are not to blame. If your own father despises sin so much, and remember, we have caused a gulf between us and the Father and God. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says, But your iniquities or your sins have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Is this what Jesus Christ was feeling on the cross? Remember, Jesus Christ was made sin for us. He was made sin for us. So if he was made sin for us and sin separates us or anybody who sins, it separates that person from the Father, from God. What was Jesus Christ feeling on the cross? That he was so separate from God that, he could, that, that God would not even hear him, it says here. It says, your sins have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear, he says. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Jesus Christ didn't do all those things. We did. But those things was put on him. And now he's feeling the separation between him and God. We've never felt that before. God has never did that to us. So we don't know how, uh, we, we don't know how Jesus feels. There are certain individuals back then in, in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament that God did, did separate himself from, from those individuals. But us as a human, like a, 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 the entire human race, we've never felt that before. Jesus did. So we can't, we can't know how Jesus felt. He felt separated from God. He felt separated from God. Now let's go back. Now let's go back. To Mrs. White's writings. Look what it says. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Wait a minute. Didn't he say, I will rise again? Yes. You know, it, when he was reading scripture, he would realize, wait a minute, this is about me. This is about me. This is about me. There, there's going to be a resurrection. That's about me. But even though he was confident that was about him, when that time when that time was there, when he was at during that time, it's crunch time now. Is it possible that Satan, with his fierce temptation, tempted Jesus Christ to doubt his own resurrection? Is that possible? Is it possible? You tell me. If it was possible, remember in Hebrews, in Hebrews, let's go back to, to the Bible. In Hebrews, it says, let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews 4, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Is it possible that Satan would tempt him to doubt 
his own resurrection? Yes, it's possible. It's possible that Satan can tempt him to doubt his own resurrection. It's possible. And then it says, look, look what it says in Philippians 2, in verse 8, it says, And being found in fashion of a man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So he had to learn how to be obedient even unto death. What do you mean he had to learn how to be obedient even unto death? Watch this. Hebrews 5, verse 8, look what it says. Um, we can start from, actually, Hebrews 5, we can start from... Verse 6, as he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, talking about Jesus Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. He's offering supplications and tears, prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears up unto him that was able to save him from death. Think about that for a minute. Think about that. Okay? He was offering supplications for, to him that was able to save him. He was super confident that he would resurrect. But now this is saying he's offering up tears and prayers and supplications unto him that was able to save him from death. Does that mean that Jesus Christ could not save himself? But he was offering prayers and supplications unto him that was able to save him from death, it says. Remember, Jesus Christ said, I lay, I lay down my, my life and then I will take it up again. How is he going to take it up? God had to save him first. God had to, God had to first activate the resurrection. I guess you could say it that way. God had to first say, okay, he can resurrect now. And then he took it up. But he can't take it up unless God had to say he can take it up. God was able to save him from death. Only him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Wait a minute, I thought he was already obedient. Yes, he was already obedient, but he had to learn obedience by the things which he suffered because he never suffered those things before. Tell me a time before that he had to suffer those things that he suffered when he was here on earth. No, he didn't suffer. He didn't learn obedience before by, the, by things that he suffered that he didn't go through. He didn't go through those sufferings. He had to go through the sufferings when he was on earth. And he had to learn obedience through those sufferings that he had to uh, go through, endure on earth. And then it says, being made perfect. Hold on. I thought it was already perfect. It says, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He became the author of salvation of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Wait a minute. I thought he was already the author of eternal salvation before this. How did he become the author of salvation um, uh, after this, after his crucifixion? He had to learn obedience, this type of obedience, not the obedience before his sufferings, because he's, he's never suffered before until he, until he, the, the pinnacle of his suffering was on the cross. He had to learn obedience even through the cross. That's why it says in Philippians 2 and verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, became obedient unto death. That means he didn't go through death before. And so now he's going through death. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It was those sufferings that he never went through before. He had to learn obedience through the sufferings, and he didn't fail. He did not sin. He did not doubt. Even though he was tempted to doubt, he did not doubt. Look what it says. Again, the desire of ages. Watch this. Saying with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. He tempted him to doubt his own resurrection. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Wait a minute. I thought he was able to see through the portals of the tomb. Yes, he was very confident. 
But again, we saw that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying and he's saying, God, I don't want this cup. Let this cup pass from me. Why was he saying that? Was he being tempted to doubt? Could he see through the portals of the tomb? What happens to you when you're dead? The dead know not anything. Watch. Ecclesiastes 9, starting from verse 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. So when you're in the tomb, you can't see anything, can you? When you're in the tomb, you don't know anything. Neither have they, they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Unless, of course, you're resurrected. But when Jesus Christ was in the tomb, he was going to the tomb. He could not see past the tomb. Because when you're dead, you don't know anything. Look what it says. Psalm 115, verse 17, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. The dead praise not... When Jesus Christ was dead, was he praising the Lord? A lot of people say, oh, he went to hell and he broke loose all the, you know, the, the, the prisoners in hell. We can talk about that another day. That's also a misconception. We can talk about that another day. But here it says, the dead praise not the Lord. So can the dead see? Can the dead see beyond the tomb? Well, even if you, if you're, if you're right now, I, I know that Jesus Christ knew a lot of the things that was happening that would happen in the future. And a lot of those things was because he was reading scripture and he knows what those scripture was about. In the Old Testament, there's so many, so many prophecies in the Old Testament that he was able to pinpoint those prophecies and he's able to say, "Hey, look." I'm going to die and I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to die and I'm going to, and I'm going to resurrect the third day. Because it was in Scripture. It was actually written in the Old Testament. And he knew that the Old Testament was about him. Remember when Jesus Christ was talking to those uh, Pharisees, he says, you look to Scripture because in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me, he says. He told them, he told the Pharisees, the Jews, he says, I'm only going to give you one sign and that's the sign of Jonah. He was in the belly of the fish Three days, three nights and three days. And then he came out of the belly of the fish. In that scripture, Jonah said that he was in hell. He was, in the, he was about the bars of hell and he was there forever, he says. But he was only there for three days, three nights. And then he came out of it. Symbolic for the resurrection. Christ knew that. Christ knew, oh wait, this is about me. Three days, three nights resurrection that was about me and so when he said when he told the, the, the jews and the pharisees he says i'm only going to give you one sign and that's the sign of jonah three days three nights i'm going to die and i'm going to resurrect he knew that about himself but when that time came satan started tempting him to doubt his own resurrection he knew that he was going to resurrect but it's possible that Satan would tempt him to doubt his own resurrection. Now watch this. Watch this. It says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Watch. Watch. Is that what Mrs. White was saying? Look what it says. Mrs. White says, Satan with his fierce temptation wrung the heart of Jesus. We already talked about that. It's not talking about him changing his mind about his own resurrection or doubting his own resurrection. But he was being tempted to doubt his own resurrection. It, it, it was even he was even being tempted to to think that oh this is this is it, this is it. You're not gonna resurrect. You're not gonna see your father anymore. You're gonna go down in the tomb. That's it for you. You don't think that Satan would? It, you don't think that it's possible that Satan would whisper that in his ear? causing Jesus to, to think all these thoughts. And that, that's the reason why he was sweating great drops of blood. For what reason? If you, if you, if you came at me with a gun and I knew I'm going to resurrect, hey, shoot me, man. I'm going to resurrect anyway. It's probably going to be, it's probably going to take me about, uh, I don't know, maybe five minutes to, to think about this. I'll, I'll just, I'll probably be like, okay, he's going to shoot me. I don't know. I don't uh, I don't know, but I can see in the future that I'm going to resurrect them. I have full confidence in this. Okay, shoot me. Probably going to take me five minutes, but to Jesus, 
It didn't take him five minutes. He was from the Garden of Gethsemane, suffering, asking God, asking his father, please let this cup pass from me. Why? Look what Mrs. White says. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. We talked about that. When you're dead, you're dead. You can't see through the portals of the tomb. Even when, you, even when you're alive right now, can you, can you see through the portals of the tomb? You can, you can hang on. You can cling on to God's promises. You can cling on to God's promise that, yeah, you are going to resurrect. But it's different for us than it is for Christ. Because with Christ, He knew what He had in heaven. We didn't. We don't, we don't have memory of heaven. He did. He did. He even, he even was talking to Elijah and Moses at the, at the Mount of um, Configuration. He knew what heaven was like. And for him, for him, forever is lost if he did not resurrect. Eternity was lost for him if he did not resurrect. That's why he was sweating great drops of blood. Because if, if this didn't work... That's it. He would not see his father no longer. That's it for him. The dead know not anything. They will not resurrect. Remember, at, remember, at the second death, at the second death, the second death is a death that there is no resurrection from. No resurrecting for the, for the second death. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb, and that's why he was so, he, he was so much in agony and pain. Hope did not present to him his coming forth the grave a conqueror or to tell him or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. So again, when you're dead, you're dead. You don't know anything. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. First of all, is the separation of sin and God to be eternal? Just just that alone. When the final judgment is finally done, separation between sin and God, was that to be eternal? Is it to be eternal? Is sin going to spring up one more time? No. Sin is not going to spring up one more time. Sin is to be separated from God eternally when that final judgment is done. And that's what Jesus Christ saved us from. Otherwise, Jesus didn't really save us. If sin is not to be uh, uh, is separated from God eternally. If, if sin is not separated from God eternally, if sin is still there after the death of, of Jesus Christ and after that final punishment, then Christ did not really sacrifice anything. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ was made sin. Watch this. Look what Scripture says. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Christ was made sin. He hath made him to be sin for us. Is sin, is sin supposed to be separated from God eternally? Yes. Sin is supposed to be separated from God eternally. And this says that God made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. So is this statement by Mrs. White so far-fetched? Is this statement by Mrs. White so far-fetched? No. It says he feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Not so far-fetched now, is it? When you, when you actually see it in Scripture, it's not so far-fetched. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the, for the guilty race. That's biblical. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Biblical. Biblical. You can find this in Scripture. You just got to read it. This is biblical. You just got to read Isaiah 53, that God was the one, that it was God's wrath that was upon Jesus Christ as man's substitute. Isaiah 53, the cup that he drank that was so bitter that broke his heart. Luke 24, Luke 21, Matthew, we just, we just read when he was at the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying, he said, let this cup pass from me. You can even go to Revelation 14. We can go to Revelation 14 real quick. Revelation 14, actually we can go to Revelation 
14 and verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive the mark or his mark in his forehead or in his right hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Drink. Look what it says. The same shall drink. What was the cup that Jesus drunk? The wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Has anybody drunk this cup before? No. The human race as a whole has never drunk this cup. Only Jesus drunk that cup. There's no possible way we can we can feel exactly how Jesus felt. There's no possible way we can feel this. There's no possible way that we can feel this right here. This is we're trying to explain something that we don't even understand. We don't even understand this. Mrs. White explained it. And this is scriptural. If you really actually read the Bible and try to understand it, this is actually scriptural. And so there are, you know, skeptics out there. They say, oh, this is, oh, this is not biblical. And this is blah, blah, blah. This is actually scriptural. If you actually read the Bible, there's this gentleman. I'm not going to say who it is. He's saying that this is unscriptural. And then he pointed to seven pages after. And we can take a look at that statement seven pages after. Again, so this is from the book, The Desire of Ages, page 790. Uh, Actually, we can start from 789. It was Christ himself who had placed those grave clothes with such care. When when the mighty angel came down to, to the tomb, he was joined by another who with his company had been keeping guard over the Lord's body. As the angel from heaven rolled away the stone, the other entered the tomb and unbound the wrappings from the body of Jesus. But it was the Savior's hand that folded each and laid it in the place in its place in his sight who guides alike the star and the atom there is nothing unimportant order and perfection are seen in all his work wow i don't i don't know how anybody can can can, can uh, dismiss mrs white's writings here jesus christ was so perfect that he took the time to even fold his own clothes after he, resurrected from, after he resurrected from death, Mary had followed John and Peter to the tomb. When they returned to Jerusalem, she remained. As she looked into the, into the empty tomb, grief filled her heart. Looking in, she saw the two angels, one at the head and the other at the foot, where Jesus had lain. Woman, why weepest thou? They asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she, said, she answered, and I know not where they have laid him. Now, this is scriptural from the Bible. Then she turned away even from the angels, thinking that she must find someone who could tell her what had been what had been done with the body of Jesus. Another voice addressed her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Through her tear-dimmed eyes, Mary saw the form of a man, and thinking that it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. If this rich man's tomb was thought too honorable a burial place for Jesus, she herself would provide a place for him. There was a grave that Christ's own voice had made vacant. The grave where Lazarus had lain. Wow. Might she not there find a burial place for her Lord? She felt that to care for his precious crucified body would be a great consolation to her in her grief. Now watch this. But now in his own familiar voice, Jesus said to her, Mary, now she knew that it was not a stranger who was addressing her. And turning, she saw before her the living Christ. In her joy, she forgot that he had been crucified. Springing, man, this is giving me goosebumps. Springing towards, toward him, as if to embrace his feet, she said, Rabbani, But Christ raised his hand, saying, Detain me not, cling not not unto me, he said. For I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father, and to your Father, and to my God, and to your God. And Mary went her way to the disciples with a joyful message. Now, this is the problem text here. This verse right here, that a lot of people are going to quote. Okay, Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. He ascended to the heavenly courts 
and from God himself heard the assurance that his atonement for the sins of men had been ample, that through his blood all might gain eternal life. The Father ratified the covenant made with Christ, that he would receive repentant and obedient men, and would love them even as he loves his Son. This is the problem text. Wait a minute. So Jesus went up after Mary was there to see if his sacrifice was accepted? Well, the Bible didn't really say. The Bible doesn't really say. The Bible is, is, is silent about this. The Bible is silent about this part. But there are clues that lead to this. First clue. Jesus told Mary not to cling to him. Watch. In John 20. Verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. So don't touch me because I have not yet ascended. Don't touch me yet. I'm not yet ascended. Okay? Don't touch me. I'm not ascended yet. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father, unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Wait a minute. Didn't that happen 40 days after? That happened 40 days after, didn't it? Did it. He says, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to my father. Yet, a little bit later, he told Thomas to touch him. Wait a minute. Let's go there. Luke 24, starting from verse 36. This was when Jesus appears to his disciples. Okay, look what it says. And as they spoke, or as, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and uh, affright, affrighted, or affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are thou, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and feet, that it is myself. Handle me and see. What do you say? Handle me. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. John 20, and verse 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were with, within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, um, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of them, saying, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it in my side. And be not faintless, but believe. He told Mary, don't touch me yet. Don't touch me yet. I have not yet ascended to heaven. But here, he's telling the, the disciples, touch me. Handle me. Know that I'm not spirit. I'm not, I'm not just spirit. I'm, I'm flesh and bones. Touch me. Put your finger in my side. He told Mary, don't touch me. He told them, touch me. When he told Mary, don't touch me. Touch me not, I have not yet ascended to heaven, to, to God. Here he's saying, you can touch me. Why? Has he already ascended to God? Did he ascend to the Father already? And that's why here he says, touch me. This is eight days later. Eight days later. It says, after eight days. After eight days. Did he go up to, to, to God? Did he ascend up into heaven? Again, told Mary, touch me not. I have not yet ascended. If he ascended and came back down, now the disciples can touch him, handle him. Put your finger in my side. I'm here. Flesh and bones. So is it so far-fetched what Mrs. White is saying here? Is this so far-fetched? Again, you can see clues of this. You can see clues. People are just not reading. You can see clues of this. So there are, there are many skeptics out there trying to decipher or trying to dissect Mrs. White's writings, and they don't even know the Bible themselves. There's one, there's one person out there that says that we believe that the 2300-day prophecy is really about Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the, the, the little horn of Daniel 7, right before the 2300-day prophecy. We'll talk about that another time. But this time, this is what we're talking about. Mrs. White's writings are beautiful. If you read her writings, it's beautiful.
there are things that she says that brings blessings to people's lives, depending on how you look at it. If you're on the skeptic side, you're going to look at it, nitpick at it, and then you're going to form your own conclusions. But if you actually look, if you actually read her writings, it's beautiful. And we can talk more about her writings at another time, but I just wanted to address this issue today. What Mrs. White says about Jesus Christ has been a blessing to me and to other people and has given me a deeper understanding of the gospel. I just want to take this time now to thank everybody who's been supporting this channel. I want to thank Andrew, um, Janet, or Jeanette, or Janet, uh, Alicia, and Gerald, thank you for the do uh, the donations via PayPal. For those of you guys who uh, want to support this ministry, you guys can do so by praying for this ministry and also donating at schoolforprofits.tv. Link is in the description box via PayPal. You guys can also donate a different way. You guys can also purchase one of these, Revelation verse by verse. For those of you guys who are having trouble with the book of Revelation, this goes through the book of Revelation verse by verse. Links for these are in the description box. Or you guys can also purchase some hats, some some SFP hats, some t-shirts at sfpmerch.shop. Link is also in the description box. All the donations do help us keep this ministry afloat. Thank you guys again. Praise God always. I'll see you guys on the next one. We cannot, we cannot afford to let the critical goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius slip out of our reach. And those impacts are getting worse and could potentially be irreversible. The debate over pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib is uh, quite a debate. You know, some people think they're, they're, they're pre-trib, they believe Jesus is coming before the tribulation, or he's coming in the middle of the tribulation, or he's coming at the end of the tribulation. We don't know for sure when Jesus will return, but God does give us several signs, several markers that we know that the end will be near. Many of those are seen in Matthew 24. We have things like wars, rumors of wars, um, pestilences and earthquakes and all these events. You know, there are a lot of dear Christians that are mixed up regarding the, um, the events, the chronology of the coming of the Lord. Uh, all Christians agree there's going to be a tribulation. You can't escape what Jesus says in Matthew 24. There's a time of trouble such as there never has been coming. Jesus is actually quoting Daniel chapter 12, where Daniel says in chapter 12, at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince that stands for the children of thy people and there will be a time of trouble such as there never has been, even under that same time. So they all agree there is this great tribulation that you read about. As you look at all the passages regarding the second coming, you realize these are things that you're going to be able to see. Every eye shall see him. The elements are melting with fervent heat. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a sauna. Um, we know it gets past 120, 130. You begin to feel it. And I, I don't know exactly what temperature elements begin to burn up, but I'm sure it's going to be quite hot. And so that's not something that you could sort of ignore. The Bible is clear that we are going to hear Jesus come back with a great sound of a trumpet. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, the Bible actually says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. He's coming back shouting with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. So again, you don't see that in many of the ideology and, and, the, and the teachings of today uh, in modern Christianity. Most of them teach it's a secret silent event. But the Bible says when Jesus Christ comes back, he's gonna be shouting in all of his power and glory. He's gonna be excited to see his bride whom he has been separated from for so long.